Exodus chapter 13, we left off there last week and the children of Israel have departed from Egypt and God has instituted the Passover and also the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now He begins in chapter 13 by instituting two memorials. The first memorial is the memorial of the firstborn, the law of the firstborn. And the second memorial is the memorial of unleavened bread, which he gives us more insight into this week. And memorials are very, very important to God. They're all the way through His Word. Something wonderful and tremendous and really unbelievable apart from Him, has occurred in the life of the children of Israel. And yet they are exactly like you and I, and that is prone to forget. And prone to forget what He has done, the power of His might, His ability, His heart towards us, and to forget it within 24 hours of Him having done it. (laughs) And there's a price to be paid for that short of a memory. There's a price to be paid for the failure to remember. And the price that we pay is that every time then we come to a new step of faith or a new trial or a new situation, it's almost as if we are beginning again. Instead of drawing upon the lessons that we've already learned from Him in what He has taken us through already in our Christian walk. And so He establishes memorials so they would never ever forget what He did for them so that they would always remember it. And for us as Christians, He's established two memorials. The first memorial is water baptism. The second memorial is the Lord's Supper. Do this, He said, concerning the bread which symbolized His body in remembrance of Me. Then concerning the cup which represents His Blood shed for us. Do this, he said, in remembrance of me. Now, it's not a fair question really to ask because we've just finished a wonderful time of worship of the Lord with one another. But when is the last time that we just sat down and remembered what he has done in our lives? What a gruesome first 24 years of my life. What a lousy, rotten Egypt it was. What a place of bondage. And how I just was grinded to powder under Satan and under his bondage. And yet I've been freed now. I've been delivered. I've been drawn out and been drawn out by a mighty arm, by His arm. And He hasn't changed from when He did that. He's never ceased to be that big. Never ceased to be that awesome, that wonderful, that loving. And so the necessity of remembering as it relates to proper perspective. You and I live in a world that pounds against us all day, every day. And it beats us up all day, every day with the temporal. Until sometimes at the end of the day, all we can see is the temporal. All we can see is is the eternal. Is We've lost sight of it. All of the deadlines, all of this, all of that, that just mounts its war against the eternal perspective. How important it is for us to have those times of remembrance. And He sets them up 
He sets them up for the children of Israel, and he has set them up for us. And so he tells them in chapter 13, verse 1, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify me all of the firstborn. And this word firstborn is in the masculine form. It's a reference to the male firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and animal, it's mine. And so every time the firstborn came forth, whether of a calf or a donkey or a lamb or a child, that one was to be redeemed. And the whole idea was that in the redeeming of that animal or in the redeeming of the child would be that reminder that we've been redeemed. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt or out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. No unleavened bread shall be eaten. This, this feast of unleavened bread was to be a reminder that we've been freed, not only delivered from Egypt, but we have been freed from the power of Egypt and the sin of Egypt. And on this day you are going out in the month of Abib, which is the first month of the Jewish religious calendar. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which He swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. You're going to need to remember this the rest of your life. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all of your quarters. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. And it shall be a sign to you on your hand as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth for with a strong hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread was established to remind the people that they were not only freed from the penalty of their sin, so to speak, there in Egypt, but also from the power of sin that they had the ability to take and put the leaven, which is a symbol of sin in the Bible, out of their house, even as God has given us by His Holy Spirit the ability to put out the leaven from our lives, to say no to sin and to say no to the flesh. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread was also designed in order that when the kids saw it, when the feast was going on, that the children would then come to the parents and say, what is this all about? Why do we do this with that natural curiosity that children have? And then we are able to tell them, we do these things for this reason. We were in bondage to Egypt and God has delivered us from Egypt. In order that the great lessons that God has worked into our lives would be passed on to the next generation. And that's very important to God. And that is a great challenge. But He set up the memorials. And so when the children are at the water baptism, they say to their mom, I want to be baptized, or their dad. What does this mean? Why are they doing it? Why is that man putting those people in the water? It gives us an opportunity to tell them why to tell them of our own testimony and what God has done. And when you partake of the Lord's Supper and the kids say, why do you do that? Why do we do this? It's an opportunity to share with them what God has done. And so God is always interested in the next generation. And he said it's to be a memorial there in verse 9. A sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's, Lord's law may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. And He wanted the memory of what He did in delivering them from Egypt to absolutely dominate and control 
their hands, what they did. They wanted the fact that they had been delivered from Egypt and drawn out from Egypt to dominate their eyes, influence everything that they saw and their perspective for the rest of their lives. They wanted this testimony, this memory of of His deliverance in the Exodus to also control their mouth, everything that they said. You shall therefore keep, verse 10, this ordinance in its season from year to year. And it shall be when the Lord speaks to you in the land of the Canaanites as He swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstling that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. But every firstling of a donkey, which is an unclean animal, you shall redeem with a lamb. That's a clean animal. And if you will not redeem it, the donkey is not worth the lamb, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And the children would be redeemed. The firstborn of the males in a family would be redeemed with five shekels. That wasn't a huge sum of money. Even the poorest of families could afford to redeem their sons with five shekels. So the issue was not the amount of money. The issue was that God wanted to be acknowledged and remembered every step of the way and in every area of their life. That's part of the abundant life. It's to enjoy life in the context of Him, every portion of it. And so it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this that you shall say to him? By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animal. Therefore I sacrificed to the Lord all males that opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeemed. So again, God says, use even this opportunity, the redemption of the firstborn, to reinforce the history of your people and what I've done from generation to generation. An opportunity to declare the deliverance of God. And it shall be a sign on your hand and this frontlets between your eyes for by the strength of, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. And so here he's speaking again the fact that they had been saved, the fact that they had been redeemed, the fact that they had been delivered, it was absolutely to be kept in the front of their minds and it was to dominate all of the work of their hand. All of life was to be lived in that, in the context, the great deliverance that God had done. Now today, many of the Orthodox Jews will wear what are called phylacteries. And you see them sometimes in large Jewish populations like New York City and certainly in Jerusalem and in Israel. And they'll wear the little box on their forehead, a strap around and a box containing uh, a portion of the Scriptures on their forehead. And they'll also wear it wrapped around and, and on their hand. And the Lord isn't really telling us to do that. And He wasn't telling them to do that. That's become an interpretation for them. And I suppose they're free to do that. But God was saying that it was supposed to dominate their lives, what they thought, how they thought, what they did, and how they did it. Now, in the New Testament, there's something superior to this in terms of our lives. That is, we don't wear phylacteries on the front of our heads, on our foreheads, or on our hands. There's no need to. Because the Word of God does not operate in our lives from the outside nor from an outside remembering or reminder of the Word of God. Because we as Christians have the Holy Spirit within us. And He does something superior to this. He writes upon the fleshly tablets of our hearts. 
His Word. And because of that, then every area of our life is dominated by His Word. And He brings the Word of God to our remembrance. And He's also the one who empowers us, empowers our hands, the totality of who we are for ministry and for service. All of this a type of something superior, even as that which causes a shadow to be cast is superior to the shadow. And so this is a type inferior to what was going to come in the person of the Holy Spirit and in the person of Jesus Christ. And then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although it was near. They're just a hundred miles now from the land of the Philistines. Just a hundred miles away from the promised land. The land of milk and honey, the land that God has promised to them. About one week's journey, just straight there and they'd be there. The only problem was, was there were Philistines, and there were the Ammonites, and there were the Hivites, and all of these ites would make them uptight. <laughs> Old gag. But I love it. And here they are, brand new now, out of Egypt, and understand their soul experience with God has been really fairly limited, though it's been a very powerful work of God. They've seen the miracles, they've experienced the deliverance, but they're really not ready to take on the Philistines. Their faith isn't ready for it. They're not ready for that battle. And so God, knowing that and knowing the limitation of their faith at this particular point, chooses to do something different in order that he might further develop their faith. And then they'll be able to take on the Philistines. God chooses our trials very, very carefully. Very carefully. But he chooses them especially carefully when we're brand new in the Lord. <laughs> and sometimes the new Christian doesn't understand that. And for the first six days or six weeks or six months, they come and hear sermons on trials and stuff. <laughs> trials. What are you talking about? Trials. Who would have trials? I've never had a trial in my spiritual life. They don't understand they're on the honeymoon. They don't understand how much God is protecting him at that moment in time and carefully choosing their trials lest they would be overwhelmed at the front. And later on, they'll cease to look down upon those of us who have trials. They'll have great compassion upon us because they'll be one of the crowd. But God is aware of our strength and He is also aware of what we're able to bear and what we're not able to bear. And He knows that they need to grow in faith and so He's going to develop their faith. How does God develop our faith? By putting us in situations that require faith. Isn't there a correspondence course? I want him to develop my faith as he shows me what he's going to bring out of my life at the end of this trial. It'd be so much easier then. But it wouldn't require faith. Because then I would know. And it wouldn't be a step of faith. It would be a step of knowing. There would be no faith at all because I would understand what was going on and I would understand where it was going to lead and how it was going to end and see all of the circumstances. And so, in order to develop faith, He must put me in a place where I have to walk by faith, where it requires faith in Him. Obedience to Him despite the circumstances. And faith is not developed in any other way. It's the only way it's developed. 
And so he's going to begin to put them in situations where the faith will be developed. One day Jesus was speaking to the disciples and he was speaking to them about forgiveness. And as he spoke to them about forgiveness, forgiving their brothers 70 times 7, and if they sin against you, forgiving them once again. And the response of the disciples was, Oh Lord, give us more faith. And Jesus' words were absolutely, as usual, incredible. He said, if you have the faith, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, and you say to that mulberry tree, be thrown into the ocean, it will be uprooted and thrown into the ocean. He was telling them about faith. Increase my faith by some correspondence course or something like that. How is my faith increased? Number one, my faith needs to be alive. Mustard seed is alive. My faith needs to be put in the proper object. You don't need a lot of faith when your God is like our God. You just need a little faith when you got a God as big as our God. And then he says to them, just use the faith you already have. And when you use the faith that you already have and you see what I do in terms of your faith and obedience to my Word, and how I show myself strong on your behalf, then you, your faith will as a byproduct become greater and increase. And so it's not a thing of sitting down and saying, I've got to increase my faith. I've got to increase my faith. I've got to increase my faith. The issue is to take a step in faith and obedience to God's Word, use the faith that I already have, and then when I see what He does, my faith will already increase. And so that's what he's going to do. He's going to take their limited faith here, their limited knowledge of him. He's going to get them to take some baby steps and they will grow as a result of it. And so God did not lead them up by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. That would have been easiest in their minds. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Oh, this is too hard. I'm going back. And so God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks, decently in an order, out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. And so they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Ethan, uh, at him, something like that, one of the two, or a combination of both, at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. And he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. This pillar of cloud and this pillar of fire, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, really speaking to the children of Israel of God's presence and speaking to them of the fact that they never went anywhere except He had been there before them. And it's the same thing with our lives. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, and notice that it says that, that the Lord spoke to Moses because it appears to be one of the most terrible military blunders in man's history. But God spoke it to Moses and said, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before pi hay between Migdal and the sea opposite baal Zephon, and you shall camp before it by the sea. So they come out of Egypt and they're to plant themselves, Moses is to lead them to this certain place. It's a very interesting place. 
High mountains on one side, the Red Sea behind them over here, in front of them really, and then this vast expanse of desert, absolutely impenetrable expanse of desert over here. And so He leads them right into the perfect place to be trapped. He's developing faith. They have no weapons. And when they camp in this particular place, Pharaoh will say to the, of the children of Israel, they're bewildered in the land and the wilderness has closed them in. I can't believe they've made such a stupid move. And then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord and they did so. Now, it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the, hearts of, the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people and they said, why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us? I mean, they're, they're beginning to sense the economic impact of losing all of this slave labor, which is just a nice way of saying that they were very greedy. They wanted their slaves back. <laughs> Sound like Satan? Isn't it interesting? As soon as he loses someone to the Lord, or the Lord delivers someone out of his grasp, or he'll always make an attempt to pull us back. You can count on it. If you're a new Christian, count on it. And he will pull out all of the chariots, all of the armies, all of everything in an attempt to pull you back to Egypt and back to bondage. And so he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. And so the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and overtook them camping by the sea besides these two places. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So you can imagine. They're absolutely trapped. They're happy. They're excited. And they see out in the horizon, and there seems to be some kind of a dust cloud out there. And all of a sudden they realize that the full army now of Egypt has come to take them captive again. And so they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried to the Lord. The Lord has apparently, it seems to them, led them into an impossible situation. Have you ever been there as a Christian? Oh, Lord. <laughs> I'm kind of doubting your omniscience. <laughs> that you know everything. <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten myself here, and I'm a dummy. Why in the world am I here? I was just trying to listen to you. This is going to blow up. I'm going to be destroyed, and your witness is going to be marred forever and ever. And it's so sad that my life has to go down in history as being the one that proves your word wrong. We hit these kind of situations. We laugh at them. But when we are in them with just our nostrils above the water, they are not so funny. <laughs> and then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? <laughs> Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? Didn't we tell you it would end up this way, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For we would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They've already forgotten how bad Egypt was. Don't forget how bad the world was. It's no better today than when you left it. In fact, I have a sneaking suspicion it's just a little bit worse. (laughs) 
But Satan is so slick, he will try to make it look so wonderful. Oh, Damien, it's not the same out here without you. That lampshade thing you did. The parties are so dead out here now without you being here. And yet I would contend that it is exactly as Peter said. It's like a dog returning to its vomit. Oh, but Satan will put little Christmas lights on that vomit. (laughs) And he will put sparklers around that vomit. And he will put spotlights that go all over the place. And he will do all of those things to make us forget that that's what it was like. They have a very short memory here. They've forgotten the bondage of it. It was the bondage of it that caused us to desire freedom. And so God gives them now some very wonderful counsel for those who are in an impossible situation. And if you are in an impossible situation tonight, not by your own doing, There are wonderful passages that deal with that. But an impossible situation by the Lord's doing that He's placed you in. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. You've lost sight of God. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And Moses knew God to be absolutely trustworthy. And how important for those of you who are older saints to have this kind of influence on the younger saints. Which He will accomplish for you today for the Egyptians whom you see today you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? He's apparently praying very fervently at this point. Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go over on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. And then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of the Lord who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar